Uh, thanks for joining us. This is David Sobel. I'm with Proven Resource and Sobel PLC. Uh, we sponsor this uh, monthly webinar for uh, a program that uh, we call uh, 2018, a woman's financial transformation or a strong woman's financial transformation in 2018. And it's we're here today with Brian Goodman, who is a mortgage banker uh, with IAA Bank. And Brian has been with a, a bank for 17 years, correct? Yeah, 17. 17. And Debbie Binder, who is the uh, West Bloomfield, a very active local real estate expert, so a licensed realtor. Um, thanks for joining us, Debbie. Thank you, David. So uh, what we do today uh, and every month is we have this program, and it's geared, as I told you when I invited you in, towards helping women, uh, you know, but men watch as well, of course, uh, understand the basic principles and fundamentals of, let's say, finance, real estate, mortgages, um, anything related to, let's say, consumer credit. That's what we've been doing for the past six months. It's been really successful. And so I'm happy to have both of you here today. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Brian had a great program, a, a, a great slideshow that was prepared. And Debbie had uh, herself a PDF uh, that was uh, geared towards real estate. Uh, helping people, especially more more uh, seasoned, uh, more, more seniors, uh, actually downsize okay. and, and tran trans any trans any transition any transitions. transitions. It could be divorce, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, what a great idea if we just all three got together because there's a lot of commonality between what we do. A lot of overlap. A, a lot of overlap. Right. Yeah. As a real estate attorney, I see a lot of the issues that Brian had written up. And I know that you and I, Debbie, we frequently talk about some of the clients that we work uh, with or in the past before he became West Bloomfield clerk uh, together. And, and um, so I, I thought that's what we would do today. And, and I thought the people who watch and our, our audience would enjoy it. So let's let's get uh, the title of, of the uh, Brian's uh, presentation was really the biggest five biggest mistakes that mortgage uh, borrowers make when they're securing a mortgage. Yep. And so why don't you kind of lead into a little bit, Brian? And then so first of all, yeah. the, the main thing is be honest with your realtor and your loan officer. Before we start into everything. Before right? we get into anything. Okay. Because let, me, let, me, let me ask you, you're busy as I'll get up these days, yep, right? Yep. So you really kind of <laughs> sift through a lot of people to, to yes. get the best applicants. Yep. And how do you usually do it, just in general? What, do you, what are the things that you're looking for? Well, the first thing off the bat is yeah. we look at a tri-merge credit report. Uh -huh. um, start early. Uh -huh. The thing I tell my clients is even if you're looking for a house in six months, it's always good to get a handle on what's showing up on your credit report so you can get it cleaned up, taken care of, even in some cases raise your credit scores 50, 70 points depending on the issues that may be on it or not. So credit. Can, yeah. I can interject sure. it too, Mitch. It, it usually is best to start with a mortgage person. We have people who come right. to a realtor first, and we will refer them to somebody we know and work with and trust, like a Brian. Uh -huh. But it's a, it, it helps guide what we're helping you look for if we have had you pre-approved with a lender so that you know you know the parameters of where you should be looking, right. and we can best meet your needs. Okay. And you're not spending your wheels showing them houses they might not be able to even right. attain. So that's called pre-qualification. Correct. Right. And, and right now in a market uh, that is as hot as this real estate market, there's no way a good seasoned realtor would even entertain Correct. taking somebody to a home if they weren't pre-qualified by somebody with uh, like Brian. And right. takes and takes yes, and to okay. expand on that, in this market where things are moving, mm -hmm. there isn't a seller that would take an offer that didn't come with a pre-approval letter. Right, and now right. not only a pre-approval pre pre and pre-qualified, yeah. we now most lenders will underwrite the file with no address, so that way oh. any red flags right. will come up mm -hmm. prior to the client putting an offer in. So we literally, with an underwritten pre-approval. We could technically close in 30 days. That's crazy because it used to be that they would never take an application without an address and a purchase agreement. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when did that start? A couple of years ago? I'm going to say about a year and a half ago, uh -huh. the company I'm at right. started doing it uh, and it works great. Okay. So do they still have to pay an application fee and everything? Uh, depending on the lender, we do not charge an application fee. You're uh -huh. under no obligation. Uh -huh. Obviously, there's no appraisal order. Right. So there's no out-of-pocket expense. It's uh -huh. just your time. 
in inputting the correct information. So how long are those approvals good for? They are good for 60 days. Mm -hmm. um, credit is good for 120. Oh. So but they do get an appraisal once they have the home. Correct. Right. And then we okay, can right. literally jump on it. Right. With the appraisal. That's like so, you know, that's interesting because I, you know, I come from mortgage banking as right. an attorney, compliance and all that. And so we would need to pull certain documentation that requires federal disclosures and compliance and follow up. Right. And that was very time consuming for a lending institution to follow up if, let's say, a, 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 a prospect was denied. Mm -hmm. But now what you're saying is people come in. The only thing that's missing is plug and play, find the house. Correct. It's such right. a competitive market right. that all we do is Mr. and Mrs. Client right. fill out the application, uh -huh. get it underwritten. We go over everything that uh, conditions that right. they're going to have to satisfy prior to closing. Uh -huh. Then all they have to do is find a house. Uh -huh. The realtor then. They're happy. Makes the offer. So, yeah. But if, but if they want to close a deal too, if you want to close that mortgage, uh -huh. you need to put your. Th this is a market where your offer needs to be a competitive offer. There, there's no room for coming in second. So then, what so, happens there? Like, how do you get? Let, let's say they're looking for a price range. Let's say the home is three hundred in this market, which I, I don't want to get into. What's, you know, the average price? We're right. just going to use it as an example. The list price is at three hundred. I, as a client, come into a borrower, come into your office and go, Brian, I'm looking for a house. Uh, in the 300 range, do they just qualify them for the max? That way they know, like, what happens? We do. Uh -huh. We do. Okay. However, and Debbie can attest to this, uh -huh. if you're a seller uh -huh. in this economy, uh -huh. you don't want any other offer other than a conventional. Oh, uh, so. Uh, so if, if, if Debbie's client, if Debbie's the listing agent mm -hmm. and has offers on the table that are both conventional FHA, right away, from what I'm told, they don't even look at the FHA really? until they see the conventional. Until they see the conventional. Uh, and right, then okay. they look to see how much each conventional buyer is putting down, sure. which then makes it stronger. Wow. Isn't it crazy? So let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. Brian, tell people why FHA. It sounds like it's a, uh, it's not a premium product or it's not something that people should engage with. But FHA is yeah. a really good product. Yes. yes. This conception right. is a very good product. Okay. So tell Years me ago, FHA okay. was for people maybe that needed higher debt to income that weren't making as much money now, what's debt to income tell the debt to income is where you take all of your minimum payments that are showing on your credit report credit cards mortgages car payments anything that has a minimum payment uh -huh. as an underwriter they look at all that and they compare it with your debt okay with your income actually uh, debt your, to income. your, your gross ratio. income versus yeah. your debt ratio okay and it has to fall within a certain guideline okay fha is a little more lenient all right um however years ago the stigma with fha uh -huh. was an appraisal right an fha appraisal was known to be a lot more stringent on the home okay uh, where sellers don't want to do anything to the home mm -hmm. nowadays fha appraisals are almost as just like a conventional right very easy they're easy to do yes but but the difference is is that in an fha program debbie why don't you share that what the fha program does add is it adds a requirement of an inspection uh -huh. and then you can come back to a negotiating point of who's going to pay for the required repairs uh -huh. so in a in a normal market it, it's a good loan you know mm -hmm. that it's going to get funded that right. it's a legitimate loan through the right. government uh -huh. however if you are, have choices mm -hmm. and you don't have to go back to the table negotiating the required repairs to come, that come from an FHA inspection, that may be a reason that a, a seller would take a, a, a conventional loan. So FHA, let me just share with the viewing public, FHA actually is an insurance program. It's not a, it's not technically a loan, but it insures the, the lender in the event that somebody defaults. They give you a higher loan amount. Government back. Right, government back. But what, what really is happening, if I want to make sure that we're all clear, is that in order to do an FHA closing, any repairs that need to be done on the home mm -hmm. have to be done. Anything that's found in the inspection, that's what they call material, something that impacts the value of the home or safety, safety. right? then it has to be repaired. And usually it's the seller yep. who has it's to make the repairs or they can negotiate it. Negotiate. Correct. Right. But now what you're hearing is it's such a hot market. Nobody wants to go through that process. Right. Correct. Isn't that crazy? Like, you know, uh, I was just talking. We were just on the, a show. The cleaner your yeah. offer, the cleaner 
your offer, right. the better chance you have of getting that gotcha. property. And so now what's happening is sellers are actually, Debbie, I don't know, I mean, they're actually looking at multiple offers and going, this is the best offer, yes. which is something like you haven't seen in years. I mean, I haven't. Yep. I, I have clients that are waiving their inspection rights really? to yes. get the home. Oh, my God. Never, and I would, I okay. Never, 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 okay. Never. <laughs> right. Never. Okay. <laughs> So that's like the gift but that keeps on giving. That's the yeah. gift that keeps yes. on giving in my office. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And um, Absolutely. I'll tell you real briefly, um, in fact, uh, like I said, we have this radio show, uh, podcast show that we're on every Saturday now. It's called Real Estate Realities, and it's with media. But uh, one of the items that we're talking, you were just on it with yeah. us. But oh. one of the items um, that we talk about is the term where is as is, which means I'm going to buy it you know, as it, in the home in its current condition. So people think that when they say where is as is, that they don't have a right to inspect. They just go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it in its current, you know, condition. But you can still do an inspection. Correct. Now, you, which I tell people, what do you mean you didn't get an inspection? Well, well you've opened yourself up to a huge can of worms. Yes. You've taken it pretty much kind of sight unseen. You don't know if it's flooding, if whatever is going on. Yep. And you're telling me, the underwriters will allow that? that that's conventional. Really? Yes. As long as the appraiser uh, inspects the property to Fannie Mae requirements, wow. they're fine. So if the appraiser walks through the basement and uh, doesn't see any water damage, uh, to him it's a dry basement. Yeah, but he's not he's not licensed he's, as an he's inspector. He's not even looking for water. But your inspect and the inspection is somewhat subject, subjective anyway. One inspector is going to find something, another is going to find something else. It's opinion. So the value isn't hmm. determined by that inspection. It's whether the person who's buying it wants to take on those repairs. But if an inspector is doing a, an actual value determination, uh -huh. right. So let me tell you how you protect yourself against you know, even though you're saying I don't want an inspection, I'm going to take this home, you know, and how it's presented. Uh, Anybody who's buying a home, actually, let's, let's go back. Anybody who's selling a home has to fill out a seller's disclosure. Yep. In most cir circumstances, unless they're exempt, that means they've never lived in the home or they're uh, um, uh, a representative of an, of an estate. That seller's they're disclosure. They're tightening up on yeah. that, too, though. They're well, I, well, again, <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving in my law office is that people do not disclose properly or they try and hide things. And so guess what? As a seller, if you don't do it the right way, you're going to ultimately find yourself in a lawsuit and, come back to and it will come back to bite you. So the seller's disclosure is in a weird, you know, it, it's kind of that balance to help people who are waiving their inspections, which I think is crazy. Right. Okay. I think it's crazy too. Yeah. I mean, you're just buying. Well, yeah. home is your, probably your biggest investment right. in life. But, uh, but while we're talking to sure. people out there, yeah. on the first right. Time, when you aren't truthful on the seller's disclosure and you say, we've never had water in the basement and then the people move in and your neighbor says, oh, there was a truck there two months ago. You have a problem. I have one. You know what? Just a quick story. I have a property in Beverly Hills a couple of years ago. People purchased the home, uh, let's say, in late winter. So like February, March. Of course, it rained in, in April and May. It came down the you know, stairs. The basement was flooded. They called a waterproofing company. The waterproofing company, and they never saw this before, by the way. Nobody would know about what was going on in the basement. The waterproofing guy came to the home, looked at his computer, because they all have laptops now, and looks and he says, you know what? I've been in this home about a year and a half ago. We were here. And he says, and here's my proposal. And my client showed photos of the home, how it was listed. The basement was beautiful. These people completely you know, decked out the basement, ignored whatever water was. I think they, you know, we think they concealed it. It's called concealment. Mm -hmm. And well, I had to write a letter and they call it a demand letter. And we had this evidence that the home inspector was there, had everything on file, had the before and after photos wow. and his proposal, which would cost like $18,000 to do. When I sent the letter, the seller went to an attorney. The attorney calls and instead of fighting, just said, how much do we write the check for Okay, which was the it kind of like Laura Isley, if you're listening, it's a slam dunk. Yeah. That's the first time ever. But it is that does happen. So I find it absolutely. You know, Brian, I should just stand outside. Give me everybody. It's, it's private, but everybody who has has waived their inspection. Yes. Right? And before sellers get nervous, though. Yeah. You have to disclose everything you know to be wrong. You don't have to search. But. Um, oh, God, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh -huh. 
you can't, there, people are not looking for the home to be perfect. They're looking for that if something was wrong, you took care of it. That you did. So if you put that, that there, right. there was a problem, you put a date, it was remediated, whether it was water, whatever it was, they uh, want to see that you dealt with the problem. They're okay. not looking for a problem. I mean, that's patient. actually a really very valuable statement. I mean, I, in fact, and most home inspectors will tell potential clients right. that, that, oh, this looks like it was taken care of properly. Uh -huh. Or this is a red flag. They should have done it, uh -huh. you know. They can tell you that. Right. And That's why you don't give up an inspection. Right. <laughs> but, you know, that what you said, it, you know, it resonates because we do. I forget it, too. Like, I expect when I'm looking at somebody's seller's disclosure that it must be perfect. Yeah. And it doesn't. And you're right. They have to do they actually have to do a reasonable inquiry into what was the cause of whatever it was. So if they have reason to know or should have had knowledge mm -hmm. and then they didn't do it, that's when they're held accountable. Um, and if you're exempt, like if you're a. Uh, um, if it's, an, if it's a non-owner occupied home and you've done the work correct and you should disclose it right because it's fraud it's considered correct. fraud you yes, don't have yes. to but it's still fraud and underwriters look at those Dude, i was going to ask you that and i had one file uh -huh. that the seller listed had water damage uh -huh. repaired uh -huh. we had to get bills uh -huh. and proof oh. that the seller did it okay. to cover our clients right you know okay behind that's a really prudent way to approach yes. so now yes. you have them under contract right yeah, you know, they, they already closed that file, oh. but yes, but uh, a, a guideline, we didn't want to lend money on a house that we knew was having water, water damage. damage. Right. So, but th and that's what I'm saying. So the offset is, well, uh, you're going to waive the inspection, but you're, and yes. you're not going to really rely on the bank to protect your interest. No, They're really protecting no. their interest. Correct. But a good underwriter is going to see that and say, you know, okay, now you have them under contract. They, they selected your very uh, aggressive offer. But now they're subject to the same type of disclosure because the underwriter's trying to protect their interest Correct. as well. Underwriter's the decision maker uh, on how, how a loan yeah. should be made. And the underwriter goes through the photos of the appraisal uh -huh. also uh -huh. looking for little things Good. that common people like us right. would not see. Right. Because we're just common. common. We, right. we had a, a sale that now that you didn't have before that the... Yeah. Underwriters raised a question that that the property it was there, you know, the appraiser that was sent by them that yeah. it appraised too high. <laughs> really? Yeah, they it appraised too it high. Appraised too high. Wow. Yeah, I mean, well, comps have to support, you know, the the purchase price. You know, a, a year ago, homes were selling at prices that didn't make sense because the inventory was low. This right. year, the inventory is even lower. But now you have a year of solid comps because right. those houses that sold too high are now you know, solid comps, the that comps. They're, that they're looking at. Right. So the market is definitely up in mm -hmm. terms of, of home prices. Inventory is definitely down in terms of home prices. So your overall sales are down even though the sale prices are higher. So let me ask you, like, is, I mean, you're so well informed when it comes to the market, and that's why I always call you. For, for stuff locally. Watch it every night. Right. No, I know you do. I know you're very active that way. You're very, um, you're well informed. Um, when you have to deal with a loan officer, mm -hmm. I know we're getting off script, Brian. But no, no, you know, but this is important yeah. stuff that people need to know. Yeah. So when you, when you have to deal with a mortgage loan originator, mm -hmm. does it matter to you that that originator works for a federally regulated institution like a bank? or a mortgage bank, such as like a uh, uh, Quicken or like an Ally or just an independent mortgage broker. Does that have some, does that have some bearing on whether or not uh, an offer should be accepted when you get a pre-approval from one of those types of uh, originators? I, mean, I guess what I would say is you do, your, when we get an offer, we uh, would do our, our due diligence. We would uh, contact the person. It comes down to if I'm working with a buyer, I'm going to send them to somebody that I know is trustworthy. Okay. Because that that, that you're working right. with the person, right. and, that, and that's the most important. Okay. To trust them and think that they can do the job. If I'm working on behalf of a seller and I'm looking at them, is are there times where if you had two comparable things that depend depending on what the pre-approval or pre-qualification process is, you might look at one that you know of mm -hmm. is stronger than another. But it comes down to again, you're yep. going to do your due diligence. Okay. You're going to pick up the phone. I'm going to answer you're a for her also. Okay. You're going to and I'll put that. myself in her shoes. Sure. She because she's experienced. Right. She knows. Mortgage company A. Right. Never closes on time. Right. Okay. Mortgage company B. Closes right. on time, but and never gets their client through the ring right. no communication. Okay. And then there's client number, you know, mortgage company number C, uh -huh. who communicates, right. does it in a timely manner, right. is professional, and, right. and, and, and closes the law. Right. So that's the reputation on Correct. the street, right? Right. 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 
And so it's not about, well, this is interesting. It's not about, well, my cousin's a realtor, you should call them. And my, my brother's a loan officer, you should call them. Or you're the closest, you're in Farmington Hills, so you're right down the street, I should go to right. you. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to name the bank, but there are many times that I go into the bank and I'll see like somebody sitting there waiting for not, you know, not all loan officers are like this at banks. And I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about like a retail bank. I understand. And not a mortgage bank. Right. And they're sitting there waiting for a loan to be approved by this behemoth bank. And it's like, you really need a mortgage bank. That's how I look at it. Correct. Would you agree with that or? No, I would, I would agree with that. Okay. You want to be able to, if a realtor or if Debbie was to call me and uh-huh. say, what's going on? Uh-huh. And I tell her honestly. Yeah. This is what's happening. Right. She's she will then say to me, how long does it take to get an answer? Right. So even though TIAA is huge, right. I know that I can go to my processor who can get to my underwriter yeah. within 24 hours. Right. And it's not even just reaching the underwriter. For me, one mm. of my requirements, because yeah. you, you know my hours. I sure. work for, you know, crazy right. hours. Mm. If I'm going to work with a mortgage person, they better be available at night and on weekends because I'm working those hours. So sure. if you're with some, some of the large banks, you have eight or nine to five, right. yes. it doesn't work. And nope. it doesn't work with real estate hours. And I tell my clients that too, oh. that I work when they have questions. Right. Right. I'm up at seven. I go to bed around 11. My phone's always on. Right. If I'm awake, but I'm available. If they wake up in the middle of the night, they can text me and right. say, oh my God, I'm nervous about this. Or if it's on the weekend, I'm always around or I'm at our open house. Right. So it it's back to the old school customer service. service yeah. which is, you know, and expanding they on can't that. call me after six, but I do give good customer service. So. Right. <laughs> but expanding on that, I think in both of our arenas, right. in mortgage and in, in home, real estate, the home part, we're selling a relationship, not a product. Correct. And your hope is that in developing that relationship and cultivating that relationship, when the person needs the product, they're going to come to you. Right. If I tried to sell a house, I might sell a house, but I'm not building a business. Mm-hmm. And the same in what Brian's doing. If right. you want to build a business, you sell the relationship. Right. And then when that person comes to you because they trust you, mm-hmm. because they know you're going to be honest with them, they know you're going to work hard for them, that's how you build a business. So no, it's a like and, no like and trust. I mean, I agree. It, it's yeah. for any professional, yeah. except yeah. dentist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right. mad at your dentist. No, not at all. Actually, I like my dentist. Um, uh, as far as dentists go, uh, let me let me ask you this. Let's change the topic for a little bit, but it's it's still along the same lines. And that is, um, so it's a hot market. These are really, I mean, extremely valuable points. So the the items that are still common to a mortgage or buying a home are going to be the same, regardless if it's a hot market or not. And that's going to be. We just talked about credit, so I'm yep. kind of getting us back. Yep. Mm-hmm. You got credit. Okay. Tell um, me what else. Another huge thing that potential clients, buyers, they tend to not be honest with themselves, and they will lie about two things. Uh-huh. Or they will they will not be forthcoming on their income mm-hmm. and how much debt they actually have. Mm-hmm. So when it comes Keeping to- Keeping in mind things like student debt and other- Student debt. Um, I have a client that- doesn't have any mortgages on a few rental properties and he didn't disclose them to me. Mm-hmm. So every lender across the country has a background check on every file. Mm-hmm. Ours is called Lexus Nexus. It's, yeah. There's fraud guard, fraud risk. Right. We will, with your date of birth, name and social security number, we will find out more about you than we really care to know. Uh-huh. So <laughs> right. I then have to go back to my client and say, do you know anything about these three addresses? And he's like, oh, yeah, um, those are rental properties, but they're free and clear. Right. Well, what I had to explain to him is even though you don't owe any money on it, when we figure out, going back to our first sure. debt to income ratio, we need to see everything that is outgoing in your monthly debt. Uh-huh. So he forgot to disclose his property taxes on property the three taxes, properties. Property taxes, right, definitely. Homeowners insurance. Right. And one of them was a condo, so there was an HOA, which wow. is a homeowners association. Right. So I had to add another thirteen hundred dollars a month. But you can offset that with a certain percentage of rent as well. Correct. Okay. But he wasn't showing the rent on his income. Tax okay, which is a great you know, this is a great which, segue. I don't right? want to off on right. the show. Right. Right. No, no, but yeah. no, it's exactly what we were talking about yeah. before we were sitting down. You know, if you you may not intend to mislead. Correct. But in this First of all, technology and then what the banks and, and just the American public have been through. Yes. There are so many checks and balances um, against fraud, against bad loans, uh, 
for uh, predatory loans, etc., that it's hard to kind of wiggle your way around a loan application without being forthright. Correct. And, and the same thing with what, you're, you know, somebody comes to you and goes, uh, yeah, I want to waste your time. I can afford that home. You're not going to take the time. You're going to actually have them go. It's like screening a tenant. If you're a landlord, I know, you know, you want to screen your tenant. You want to screen your borrower. And you're going to use a loan, a good, reputable loan officer to do that. It's key to have somebody that you can trust as a loan officer. Right. And if I was to come back to Debbie uh, 30 days into the process and uh, say, oh, we did. Joe Smith didn't disclose three properties. The deal's now dead. And she took the, the home off She'll the market. She'll kill you. <laughs> She's not too happy right. with me right even now. Though, even though, you, even even though, though they lied to me, right. it's my... That's a different, that's a different, uh, um, that's developed over the past. I mean, you've been in the business 17 years, right? I try to ask everything, but sometimes right. you think you know somebody right. and they just don't tell you the, the full truth. Yeah, that's about having clients, yes, right? Yes, right. yes, yes, it's yes. Like a, it's like peeling an onion. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, though, when you talk about, like, not telling the whole truth. We were talking about this earlier. So if, if you put income down that isn't real uh -huh. and somehow you get through the system, um, and people still do. There's ways to manipulate the system. Sure. Um, it, it could be gleaned out later on, actually, to your disadvantage. So I'll give you an example. They tell you they make, you know, 10000 a month. And they buy the home that Debbie's shown them. And you, you know, the bank has made the loan. And three years later or three months later, they file bankruptcy because they really couldn't afford the, the home. Or they weren't living in the home. They were using it as a rental property, whatever it is. Ultimately, they're going to get caught, and I'll tell you how. If they file bankruptcy, uh, they have to disclose their income. The systems in the bankruptcy court, plus very astute attorneys who work down there, look and verify income, and they also compare it to your tax returns. Yes. And, oh, did you file taxes? Well, let's see what your tax returns show. Well, wait a minute. When they look at your tax returns, that's not what you represented on your loan application. So what you've done is you've done two things. You've committed tax fraud, and you've also committed bank or loan fraud. Yeah, loan fraud. Right. Yes. And so if you talk about a gift that keeps on giving, that's one of them. <laughs> it happens quite a bit. So it, it doesn't pay to go down that route where no. you just mi try to mislead or give fake tax returns. It's much harder. Correct. I mean, you have systems now. I know that you can go to the IRS. You do the 4506s. Correct. But they come quicker, right? They do come quicker. Tell, tell the audience. For those of you, um, a right. 4506 is basically a transcript that we get behind the scenes from the IRS to verify the validity of the tax returns that you supplied us. Um, years ago, uh, when I got my start in the business in 01, um, the subprime market was huge. And... Um, there was companies out there that were manufacturing W-2s and tax returns for their clients. They were inputting what the client needed to make in order to get the loan. Um, there were no checks and balances back then because of uh, everything that happened and the fall of the mortgage industry. Now there are so many checks and balances, like I said earlier, we know everything. So um, even if there's $100 off from the transcript to your tax return, we're going to find it. And we're going to ask what happened. And then we come to find out there's a lot of amended tax returns, which the borrower forgot right. to give me. Right. They gave me their original right. and not the amended. Right. It, 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 there's always cans of worms opening up in my business. Right. Um, and, yeah, it's just it's, – it's scary, but it's good. The checks and right. balances that are in place, I tell people – it's like getting a loan. I, I got married in the late 80s, and I had to show everything when I got my mortgage. Then halfway through, 10 years later, we bought our second house. They didn't ask us for anything but our credit score and a pulse, basically. Right. Um, right. But now it's back to the basics where you have to prove your income, prove, prove uh, you know, how much bonus money you get, and going back to the gentleman who didn't disclose uh. his rental income, right. there's nothing wrong with not disclosing your rental income, but if you don't disclose it on your tax return, it is not money that I can use to qualify you. Basically, the only income is W-2 income, mm -hmm. and I think I talked about self-employed. Self-employed income is a whole other, right. we could it's, talk hours on right, that. I know, it's, um, it's hard. Unfortunately, I have doctors and lawyers who right. make very good living, 
uh, but they have really good accountants. Right. They write things off, and they can't they qualify for the type of house they want on Some, paper. Right. Sometimes those those self-employed people have to bite the bullet for a couple of years and actually report the income. Correct. Uh, without taking off the expenses, but yep. that that's a different. You know, that would be that's a different a whole day, right? Episode, yes. Let me let, let me ask you this because. Um, uh, another area that, again, is an, uh, a common theme, regardless if you're buying or selling uh, and you need, you know, you need to get a mortgage. And that is not having enough money. Right. Tell me about that. So you're dealing with Debbie buying a house. Well, she it's doesn't really actively sell now. Correct. OK. She's just a, her right. no, but we can she's an active her. Right. expert. I, I, what <laughs> happens is they're working with their realtor. The realtor showing them, let's say, a two hundred fifty thousand dollars house, and they know that they need five them for a conventional or twenty percent down to not have PMI, which is mortgage insurance. Um, and they're figuring on they need fifty grand to not have PMI. Okay. So they're like, just they saved enough, they got their fifty thousand. They're working with Debbie, looking for a house. They call me, and they most consumers and buyers assume that the closing costs and prepaids, and I'll get into what prepaids are, can be rolled in the loan like a refinance. But when you purchase a home over and above your down payment, you are going to need to set up an escrow account. And what an escrow account is, it's your taxes and homeowners insurance for the year amortized over so many months, depending on what month you close in, has to be brought to the closing table on top of one year paid homeowners insurance up front. Wow. So on average, on an average two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, you're gonna need, I always tell people five to seven thousand dollars more for closing. Wow. Now in the past, and I'm going off tangents, sure, I would have my clients tell the realtor to ask for seller concessions, but because oh. it's such a hot market wow. right now, wow. there nobody's taking offers with seller concessions because they don't have to. So a lot of my young right, newlyweds, right. first-time home buyers who need some help with the concession. They can go FHA. <laughs> no, but, I'm just kidding. but even right. the FHA, right. if the home it, it's a catch twenty-two. Right. The so seller they don't doesn't want to take FHA. Right. So that's that's yeah. why I said yeah. but, so you're so what do you do? Like they just go well, aim for a, a less I, expensive home. You less if expensive? you're with somebody you trust, you're yeah. gonna know that up front. So a, okay. a, a good lender yeah. is going to explain that to their to their clients so that they know to factor that into their what they can their affordability and yes and if you start early enough at least 60 days there's a seasoning thing so if a mom or dad or relative is lending you or gifting you keyword gift uh, gifting you the money and that's tracked down too it could go into your bank account prior to 60 days of the transaction uh, and we don't have to ask you don't have account. to verify it oh. correct that's but interesting. If, but if it's within 60 days of the closing, we need gift letters. We need the donor's ability. So we need to see the account it came from, uh, from the donor. Do you have to verify the donor's income? No. Okay. But a lot of times the donor doesn't want to give 60 days of bank statements. So oh, they have to give you bank statements. Correct. It used oh, to be that we can get oh, a letter from the bank manager right, saying right. at the time of this gift. Like an average there, balance? Correct. Okay. Wow. Yes. So that's why I always tell clients that are getting gifts, let's get it in the bank right away uh -huh. and not have to worry. We, let's get it seasoned. Okay. I have a question because this goes along the lines with Debbie's um, uh, theme tonight, which was people in transition. So if you're a, a recent divorcee or, you know, you're single um, or, you know, or you're older and you're, and you're single, um, Affording a home, to, of course, based on income, it makes it much more difficult. Do you do a lot of, I, I mean, do. Debbie, are you selling a lot of homes to uh, single people? We've worked with many single people. Right. And I was there. Yeah, right. I, I, that, that, yes. I bought my first home by right. myself. It's harder, though. It makes it more difficult, right? Well, you're, you're working on a different, you, you, your numbers are different at all. So your, your income is different because right. you're relying on one and a single, single income. income. You're you know, obviously what you're going to be able to afford is a, is a lower price than what two people, you know, two can afford. Um, I guess it's all relative. And right? again, it's, it's relative, relative, but a lot of times it's a shock value. Okay. It's hard enough going through a right. death or divorce. Right. And then you have spouse, to buy a home. And then to have to buy a home. Okay. Right? 
it can somewhat and to learn and to learn the process and that's the one thing i do see over and over and i'm sure you do too people who are entering the market for the first time due to death due to you know divorce or whatever it is mm. they they just don't know it, right and, and it is it, it's it, a lot of work too to a, get the information right so it's a lot of educating and, and, and coaching them through it, but just from A to Z. They don't know where do I start? What, what's the first thing I do? What's the first call I make? They've, they've never done it alone. So it's, it's. And their credit, if they've had like a divorce, I mean, I, I mean this is stereotypical, but it, it, it seems to be the general rule, not the exception. If you're going through a divorce um, or there's a death, credit does get impaired. It can be impaired. Mm -hmm. And, and, you and you could have debt in the house that you own. Oh yeah, jointly. Yeah, and sure. And Correct. And sure. Depending on the divorce decree right. and what it states and who's responsible, mm -hmm. that debt ties into your debt right. income. Right. So, yeah. And key, what I tell yeah. all my middle-aged clients, uh -huh. you never know what to expect mm -hmm. when death happens. Make sure that both spouses have credit in their own absolutely names. okay absolutely. joint credit that they, they think is joint is not i had a client lost her husband after 40 years of marriage uh, she was on everything however the credit cards she was a co-signer she wasn't her wasn't social her. security number was not tied to the accounts it took a couple years for her to get back on her feet mm -hmm. with the credit card and getting her credit score up it's not that she had, she didn't have bad credit, she just had no credit. Um, so I, wow. it's key that everybody. Like no income. If you right. have no yes. income or you don't yep. have credit. Well, I mean, if, if, if there's one takeaway today, besides the fact that uh, people are buying homes without any inspections, <laughs> <laughs> which is crazy to me, but um, is the credit. Yes, yeah. credit is key. With well, credit's anything. important, right? Correct. But uh, what you're doing if you're renting, right? I mean, you cannot get housing without credit, whether right. you're renting or buying. Right. You but to be informed key. that if you're and, and there's still a lot of people who are uh, stay-at-home moms, sure. or you know uh, they go through and they take a card, you know, when they're first getting married. And it's you know, with all, it's in the wage earner's name. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound sexist or in, in any way, shape, or form. It's usually the male or the husband or the breadwinner now Correct. because it doesn't matter right? right it's just one person's making the money most of the money and yes. the other person staying home tending to children or just not working yeah and they don't they don't uh investigate further they just get si a co-signer correct and that's a problem and now if that one person's on the loan that's debt against them they've been a stay-at-home parent and right. they have no income coming in to offset that debt right. they're gonna have a very hard time right. on the home right yep that's that's listen or to these car. two people because that's car. really yes. co-signing on a car and uh -huh. student loans for your children uh -huh. or for your niece nephew brother sister it's your debt look it's your debt right so when you go to buy a home you have to disclose that right correct co-signer yes and student loans are a killer i mean i, I deal with a lot of um uh large student loan issues uh and negotiating those um and one of the issues is parents who are trying to get off their children's student loan that's usually grad students and they're like i didn't realize i'd be on the hook for like you know three hundred thousand dollars of med school and you're like well you did co-sign it you know what they call co-signers don't you in law what? What? idiots with pens that's <laughs> wow. what they call them but uh that, that's just a joke a lawyer joke uh, uh, but this is still a non for you know informal oh, sure, sure. Better, so one thing to add to what for somebody who's coming is in transition and is looking to buy their home and for really anybody when you do get pre-qualified and they do give you a range of where you should be looking uh -huh. that's not a range where you have to look so in other words if they give you a home that you could purchase and you're used to paying 1800 a month is mm -hmm. your comfort zone but they tell you that you can afford a house that puts you at a 2600 a month mortgage payment and you say well wait a minute i i that's a big step for me you don't have to buy that. You know, Correct. you have to, you have to use some common good. sense. There I mean, again, you have a, another very, that's a jewel. You know, that what you just said is really important. That's key what she just right. said. I have people I've worked with in the past uh, as a loan originator. Right. We're commission only. Right. And we get paid on the loan amount. Right. So there are plenty of predator lenders out there that don't care that you are coming from 1800 and they're putting you in at 2500 a month. Because they rather do a mortgage for two fifty rather than one seventy five. Right. Right. 
So I agree with Debbie. Right. Stay in your comfort zone and don't be afraid to tell your lender that. And the, the worst thing you can do, the worst decision you can make in buying a home is to have your lifestyle change to accommodate your house payment. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a horrible situation. It, Nobody's happy with that. It's really home. interesting, Debbie, because uh, and we, we do have to wrap it up shortly, oh, but okay. it's really a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And that is, even though you're looking at debt to income, like credit, there's a lot of things that never get accounted for um, on a regular basis, right? Um, on a monthly basis. So a borrower coming to you doesn't really have to disclose or even have to consider in the debt ratio, why well, I, I have a pet that I take care of. I have a water bill. Water bills aren't put in to the monthly equation. Nope. Um, how oh much ga- electric, how much you pay in gas for your car. Uh, the car note may be uh, calculated into your, your credit uh, ratio but or your debt ratio. But there's a lot of, as we know, life is expensive, and there's a lot of things like back to school items. And your food's not in there. Right, and your food's <laughs> not in there. So when when somebody does the debt ratio, is there a rule of thumb, Brian? I mean, that where, where you say, good goodness, it really, even though we go 28 percent of the total gross income, you should really back off your, you know, ex- right. Expenses. I, 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 what you just said, yeah. I always remind clients, uh, don't forget, you have to eat. Don't right. forget, you need gas to get to work. Right. It's the and like what Debbie said, you don't want to be house poor, especially when you are transitioning from sure. two incomes to one. Right. If there's a death or divorce, you do not want to be house poor. And right. that's and that's important when you are making that transition. Your overall payments are not half of what they were when you were married. Your mortgage, whatever it is, is the same. You may buy a little bit less expensive home, but your utilities aren't half of what they were then when there were two in a home. Right. They're at least 80, 90 percent. So you have to keep in mind that your 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 you're things are unless, unless you're in my household and you leave the lights on constantly and you're always like staying in the shower way too long. But other than that, I but, got you. But it's a golden nugget too. You, you, you right? have to know that, yes. that your 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 expenses don't get cut in half, and okay. you need to really plan for where, what what your comfort zone is. Yeah. Okay. Don't don't overspend. We haven't even gotten through half the stuff that you brought. But these are important things. Oh no, they're really yeah. important. What um, you know, we're, we are going to be done. Yeah. We, we, okay. <laughs> we do have to wrap it up. But let me ask you that. Like, if you, we just talked about golden nuggets. What would be the one thing you would want people to know when they're coming to see you to make a loan application? Besides, like, make, maybe bringing you coffee or something. What would be the one thing you wish they would tell you or you want them to know about the process that would make both your life easier and their life easier? I think the key for me is I want them to know that there's an open line of communication and they need to be honest. If they're nervous about something, communicate it. If they don't like something, communicate it. If they're scared, communicate it. Buying a home is scary. Mm -hmm. Um, Not taking it back. Yes, wait. Debbie and I have talked earlier prior to tonight we are both hand holders. We are there for our clients. Yeah. It's scary. It's a big step buying a home. It's a big step moving. It's a big step selling. We're here to answer your questions uh-huh. and just be honest. And we'll be honest with you. So how do Brian, how do people find you? How, uh, how do they get in touch with you? But basically my cell phone is uh-huh. 248-390-5929. Uh, my email is brian.goodman at everbank.com. Uh, we're changing our name to TIAA uh-huh. in two weeks. So it'll be Brian at Goodman at TIAA bank.com. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank so you. let me ask you, um, uh, Debbie, I'm going to ask you the same question and you had some really good uh, things to share tonight, but if there was one thing you wanted people to know, I know that you're the West Bloomfield uh, township clerk. No, and you're, five, but I, but I have a partner that we work. So I, okay. we have availability. I'm glad you clarified that yeah, for I everybody. A, I have a partner during the day. So uh-huh. I'm eight to five. I'm not doing the real estate, but okay. at nights and weekends I'm available and my partner is available during the day. So tell me, what is the one thing, I mean, you've really gone through a couple of things just like Brian, but what would be, besides communication, because we all would agree as professionals, I'm putting you on the spot, but mm-hmm. we all would agree professionals, you know, good professionals do want transparency, they want good communication, uh, return phone calls, take care of the client, but what is the, what would be another item uh, that you find important? The, the, again, going back to that it's a relationship business, yeah. for the next few months, we're the people you're going to be dealing with morning, noon, and night. You know, right. so, so you really have to trust that we're giving you good advice. What sets agents apart from another is one, their their customer service and their market knowledge. Okay. 
Okay. So those are really the two things you're looking for. Somebody you trust that has the, the customer service that's available till 11 at night, that answers that phone when you need the question. I'm checking. I'm going to call you at and 1130. He, oh, he will. He will. And, <laughs> okay. so somebody, and then somebody who knows their market. Okay. You, know, you, 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 you need to be watching your market. I watch every night before I go to bed what has come on the market, what has had a price reduction, what has sold. And what what has gone pending? You got, you need to work with someone who knows their market. It's pretty addictive, isn't it? Oh, it is addictive. Yeah, especially now, it's it's really it's exciting. Crazy. Sometimes you just go. Right. <laughs> Some, I, I, sometimes I'm overwhelmed, and uh, I'm like, "How do they do it?" Right. You know. Oh, sure. Because I'm on Zillow and Realtor.com. Right. Realtor right. But the other day, I did an open house with a realtor, uh -huh. and she was on. The I MLS, saw that. Right. And it was like, "Oh my God, there's so much to have a pulse on." Like, right. You know, and you know. And in, and in this market, you know, the, the relationship is always important, the market knowledge. In this market, you really need somebody who is available, accessible, and ready to jump with the creativity and knowledge to help your offer look more appealing than the other one. And you don't have time now. In this yeah. market, you don't, you can't sit on the sidelines. Right. Did you hear that? It's all really important. These are two of the most important players in the industry is a, a fine real estate agent and a very knowledgeable mortgage loan officer. You also need a, a very astute real estate attorney who has many years experience doing these um, transactions. Yes, do we. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> that. And there are other people in the business too uh, that you need to work with. Those are title companies, uh, title agents, home inspectors, um, uh, appraisers, um, contractors. So there's a lot of other people that help the process. So none of those matter if you don't get the house. That's a very good point. <laughs> That's actually really important. So with that, I'm going to close and and thank you both, uh, Debbie. I didn't. I, I know Brian gave uh, the phone number and where it can be located. What is your phone number and how can you get uh, okay. people getting in contact with you? Nights and weekends. My number is two four eight five six three three zero one four. Um, and my partner during the day is Linda Deutsch, and her phone number is two four eight seven zero five. Zero four nine four. Sure about that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, two four eight <laughs> seven zero five zero four nine four. Okay. So I want to thank both of you again. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Uh, this thank is David Sobel. I'm with Sobel PLC, Improvement Resource, and and we are real estate and finance attorneys. Um, tune in uh, every. Well, actually, it's going to go to every weekend now. Uh, we're moving our show to. Um, it's called New Radio Media, and that's. Uh, a show called Real Estate Realities. It's on at 10 o'clock every Saturday morning uh, over here in Farmington Hills, and it prod broadcasts uh, pretty much throughout the whole state of Michigan. And we invite your questions, comments, and concerns about real estate. How yes. do you get the app? Um, oh, and yeah, that's right. And there's a new app. Uh, this is a, a new, a very big venture. It's very exciting. And I co host that with a, a friend and, and very astute real estate investor named uh, Dylan Tanaka. So that's called Michigan. Uh, actually, it's called um, Real Estate Realities, and you can reach me at uh, 888-789-1715, and you can go on the web and reach us at www.provenresource.com or dsobel at provenresource.com. Thanks, and have a great evening. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thanks, Dave.